and welcome to Science at Home. My name is Anna and I am talking today with Andreas, who is a researcher Hi. at the <laughs> observatory here. So uh, we have a few questions for Andreas. I hope you're happy enough to answer them. Uh, my first question um, is, where are you from and how did you get to be here at AOP? Oh, that's an interesting question. Thank you. So. Um... As some of you might already hear from my first words on my accent, I'm originally from Germany. So I grew up in a well, rather small town, still three times the size of Amma, but about 45,000 people. Um, I decided to eventually study physics and uh, that brought me then eventually to astronomy. So um, I uh, studied in Potsdam, which is um, yeah, I think, think like 180,000 or something. A city near Berlin um, with uh, a university that was quite known for also doing astrophysics. Um, and then I ended up uh, doing my PhD there, uh, specializing in a field that is very important in astrophysics, but it's not done at a lot of different places. But Amar essentially is, is one of the places where you have some really good expertise about that. And that then brought me to uh, the fact that I was doing a postdoc here in Amar, and that's how I got here. <laughs> Brilliant. That's really interesting. So you've come quite a, quite a way. Yes. Yeah, it's taken you far your career. So um, can you explain the type of research that you do here? You sure. said that it's very, uh, it's not done a lot of places. What what it is, yeah. what, what does it involve? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So um, how do I start? Well, the, the easiest thing is probably the, the light that we see from a star actually comes only from the very outermost layers. So if you if you have the light that's eventually it's uh, um, originally it's produced in the center, but it takes millions of, le of years to reach the outer layers. And then from the outer layers, it finally can leave the star to reach uh, us on Earth. For example, the, the light of the sun takes about eight minutes to get from the sun to the Earth. And so if we want to understand um, the light from a star, we actually need to understand its outer layers. And so the, the field that I got in, and, and this was never something I originally imagined I would end up, but uh, it turned out to be way more interesting than somebody would think from the outside, is the study of these outer layers, uh, in particular for hot and massive stars. And so um, the, the technique that I'm mostly working is, is modeling these outer layers, which we call the stellar atmosphere. Uh, and that's complex enough that you can't do this just with a few calculations on a piece of paper, but you actually need sophisticated models in the computer um, and this is the kind of technique that I'm specialized in, and that's what I'm doing uh, most of the days. And so the, the very uh, fundamental part of this research is that you can actually combine theory and observations uh, because you, you have the spectra that you can observe from an actual star and you have the model at hand that also gives you an artificial spectra. And the better they match, the more we understand about what's actually happening in these outer layers of the star. And then we can deduce other parameters such as the history of the star or the current status or hopefully also draw conclusions about its further fate. Wow, that sounds really impressive. <laughs> I'm sure that's um, that's really interesting. Is it, yeah, it, mostly. it seems <laughs> quite, quite niche then? Yeah, so the, the, the niche in this thing is that a lot of people want to understand stars or need this, this knowledge about stars to put it in the greater context. Uh, but especially hot and massive stars are not like our sun. And uh, in the normal everyday life, that's quite good because they have a lot of UV radiation. They have very strong winds and all this would bother here, us here on Earth quite much. Yeah. Um, but the, the big massive stars, they are actually driving the cosmic evolution. So they are producing the heavy elements. They distribute them. They eventually collapse. And that might uh, come um, at the same time as a big supernova explosion that, that kind of blows away a lot of material. Uh, eventually... Uh, distributing the kinds of, of material like carbon and oxygen that we are made of. So we needed these stars beforehand to get here. And this is one of the goals that I'm, that I'm trying to understand. But to, to model these kinds of stars with these uh, physics, which are um, yeah, quite complicated in, in how they interact and, and what you have to consider, this is, this is the niche in that, in that sense. But it's, it's kind of an important niche because it, it reveals some of these uh, cornerstones of our universe. That's really, really interesting. Now, most people, when they hear about astronomy, sort of think about going and sitting at a telescope and staring at the sky for hours. But um, you were saying you use modeling mostly. So do you ever use telescopes? Would you ever go out and just sit and look at the stars or? 
That, that, that's a good question, actually. So um, I have used telescopes, but rarely for my direct research. So okay. um, in undergraduate, I had to do some some course at the actual telescope that we had at the observatory. And I think it's it's a great experience because even though I don't do this in my everyday life, I still need to be aware of the techniques. And so the stars that I study usually are too far away. Um, to, to use the, the standard telescopes, even the ones that we have at AOP. So uh -huh. we need to apply for either space-based telescopes or for very large telescopes sitting, for example, in Chile or in, or in other really uh, uh, locations that have really good seeing conditions, which we unfortunately don't, don't have here. Okay. Uh, but but that's, that's the, the, the stuff I need. And so usually I have very well-trained colleagues who can make sense of the data that these telescopes uh, um, collect and then already give me a data set that's already been reduced, which is kind of an okay. art in itself. So usually I'm quite relieved that I don't have to do it myself. But in some cases you need to, and it, and it's good to know the general processes and the, the steps that need to be involved. So uh, while not everybody who is an astronomer would sit at the telescope, yeah. um, as long as you're a hardcore theoretician, you are always depending on somebody sitting on a telescope. So it all links back to that then, yes. yeah. Yeah. So what you've told me so far, uh, certainly I think I would struggle to understand it. So um, you're obviously very good at what you do, but what part of your research, if any, do you find really difficult? Oh, there's there's a lot of stuff that I find difficult. Um, probably one of the, the hardest parts is that even, even though these models are sophisticated and computers get better and better, we still cannot treat all of the physics that we have in our models uh, or that we would love to have in our models. Let me put it that way. So okay. um, we have to make approximations. We have to think about what not to consider and what to consider and what is more important than, than some other effect. And that's sometimes that can be a really tough choice. And so I have spent quite some time in the past on some things where we thought, oh, this might be important. We should incorporate this. You spend a lot of time, you work on it. And in the end, you find out it doesn't really make a difference to the spectrum that you get out. So it, okay. um, sometimes sometimes you can you can make good assumptions and good guess and calculations to, to deduce what to consider. But in other times, it's just trial and error. And of course, there is the situation that uh, a lot of the researchers probably won't talk about all the time, but it's it's very natural in the life of the researcher. You, you find a lot of interesting results, but also sometimes your result is just that there is no change, even if you have spent quite a lot of work. And the good thing is um, you shouldn't hesitate to also publish something about that because that's also important for the other researchers to know to not invest the same time in that. Cool. So, so that must be quite frustrating then in the end that, you know, you well, kind of, you're looking yeah, for charismatic results and then <laughs> they don't appear. It can be to a certain degree. Um, and I think the importance is to not, um, let that affect your enthusiasm for the field. So as, as long as you find some results, and that's also the importance of being in the group. So if, if you don't do that alone, if you have collaborators, uh, they are usually, um, they will try to tell you that, that it's important to do these things and that it's not uh, just uh, your own and it's not your fault, even if you get a, like a zero result. So the good thing is I had more non-zero results than zero results, but I just wanted oh, yeah. to say that it, it's part of, of, of every kind of scientific career yeah. uh, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't be held back by that. Um, as long as you find passion for the field, I think that's the important thing that you should, uh, that you should have to do this. Oh, absolutely. Well, that actually leads me really nicely on to the next question. Have you always had a passion for astronomy or did you come into this later in life or? Oh, well, that's, uh, you, you could view it the simple picture. I was fascinated by stars and planets as a child and now I'm an astronomer, so case closed, right? Well, yeah. it, it didn't, it, it didn't, uh, it wasn't that straight line that you could think. So um, I was, when I left school, I didn't really know what to do, to be honest. And at that time in Germany, okay. you you, uh, you had to do still civil service. So that gave me a year off to, to actually uh, think about how nice actually learning and getting to know stuff is, because a lot of people are quite bored when, they, when they're in their final school years and think, oh, I don't yeah, want to do course. this all again. Um, but at that time, it could have been physics, could have been history, um, economics, whatever. Uh, my interests were relatively broad, but I, I had 
physics was was one of the things I was interested in, and I wasn't afraid of math, which I think everybody shouldn't be afraid of math, um, because it's it's not really that hard. It's more like the feeling that you think it's hard that that makes it uh, that makes it uh, hard for some people. And so in the end, I decided to study physics and I chose the university that I went to because astrophysics was one of the things they were strong in. But still, um, after one or two years, I thought, oh, maybe I'm doing something completely different. I was also fascinated by particle physics and other stuff. Um, but in the end, it was a combination of what was um, the topic and what were the colleagues who were doing that. So it's it's yeah. it's the interest in the topic, but it's also the community surrounding it that then got me back into astrophysics and that eventually got me uh, stay there and doing a PhD and now trying to, to do a career in astrophysics. Brilliant. There always are things like that. As, as much passion as you have for the field, yeah. there are practicalities <laughs> that make yes, all the difference. But also, I think the passion comes uh, after a while when you actually do the things. So you don't really know what what you're passionate about unless you you at least try to do stuff so yeah. so what i would what always recommend is keep keep looking into field see if you if you click with it don't give up after the first day do it for a while and then then you will start getting interesting because as i said stellar atmospheres if you read about as a as as uh, uh, as a child you think about oh it's all black holes it's all galaxies it's it's those those big names that you have no idea what the physics are but that look either amazing or that sound very cool um, and in the end you find out it's it, yes that that can be interesting but there are other things that that might be just as important uh, to understand the big picture that you've never heard of but suddenly you 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 study an object and that that was my lucky situation with the thing that I did for my diploma thesis which is a bit like people doing here a master thesis, bachelor plus okay, something yeah. or something. Um, I, I could make later a paper out of that that already had an impact in the community. And then I saw that by by doing some work that is that you can just do when you when you are finishing university, you can already make an impact to the actual scientific view in the community. And that was very, very motivating. And that, of course, um, um, was one of the reasons why I decided to stay and do a PhD. Brilliant. Now, we always think about astronomy, as, as, as I've said, as looking through telescopes. But mm -hmm. there are telescopes all over the world. And you said you'd been a few, been to a few, whether or not it was directly for your research. But um, do you have a favorite place? Where's the coolest place or the more ex most exotic place that your research has ever taken you? Good question. So I haven't been at a lot of telescopes personally, simply because I okay. get usually the data from others. So I have some colleagues who had the pleasure to fly to Chile to the VLT and the Atacama right. and see all that. Um, so the place that's probably was most exotic uh, for me was a conference because the good thing is even if you don't go to the telescopes you still go to conferences yeah of and course. Uh, conferences can be all over the world and uh, one of the one that that was m i would say most exotic for me and also very far away was in new zealand and so uh, that that was a really really nice meeting the meeting was good and then of course uh, i looked at what do the regulations allow me how long can i stay of course paid on your own but still when yeah. you already fly there you don't want to just see a conference room so i used of the course. chance traveled a bit around the the northern island at least and uh, um that was that was a super nice experience and i would think uh, it's it's one of the reasons why i then probably privately funded but i would like to definitely go back there for a, for a longer holiday in a while <laughs> awesome new zealand's a really lovely place i've never been but i would love to go now we come to the last question so um well done so far <laughs> it's been <laughs> really interesting to hear now this is more of a philosophical question i suppose why should more people consider science for their future career well i think you shouldn't do science if you're not interested into it but the the point is once you are interested in don't don't tell yourself oh it's too hard or um it's not something for everybody um, as long as you have a passion and uh, are are not afraid of doing it, I think you should definitely do it. And one of the big advantages in a job like this is that you have a lot of freedom how you want to work, uh, where you want to work. Um, you can you can discuss the results. Uh, you can you can really 
make an impact into how we we see the world and how we understand the world. I mean, when I started studying physics, I thought like, oh, in two years from now, I can explain the world. And uh, okay. what, what I would have to say is no. In the first years, you will always learn what you don't know. So uh, <laughs> yeah. you, have to, you have to get through this. Um, but after a while, you're, you're understanding that you've maybe asked yourself the wrong questions in the first place because we, we don't know everything, but we start to get an idea of how everything that we know is built and how we can extend this. And once you're in this mode, then it's really getting interesting. Um, and whether that's astronomy or chemistry or biology or, or computer science, that should just depend on your personal interests. And I would say everybody, um, don't be afraid of doing it. Don't be afraid of, of mathematics. It will always come back in, in one or two things, but um, it's it's not something that's that's super hard or that cannot be done. It's kind of another language uh, that you just, once you learn it, you actually apply it. And a lot of people of us are, are capable of thinking very logical and and when they don't know it's mathematics, they are good at it. But once you tell them, oh, that's mathematics, they think like, oh, this is hard, <laughs> I shouldn't do this. Yeah. So, so just try to be open minded, give it a try and and just do whatever you like. Test test out different topics to, to find out what you like. And once you found something that you're really passionate about and where you maybe have good colleagues um, that, that can uh, help you to, to get better there, then just do it. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Andreas. This has been a really interesting conversation. I'm glad that um, you were willing to come on and get, have a chat with me. Thank you um, for the invitation. No problem. All right, everyone. So we'll uh, see you next time on Science at Home. And hopefully we'll see Andreas again for uh, an interview uh, about maybe about his research, what he um, sure. studies. We can learn some more about that. All right.